Our speaker today is physicist Dr. Robert Park, and he'll be talking about superstition, belief in the age of science. And this is also the title of his uh, most recent book, which was published yet last year. He's a professor of physics at the University of Maryland. Uh, he's a longtime friend and well known to uh, NCAST members. Uh, he publishes uh, a news editorial column online called What's New, uh, which has the best disclaimer I've ever seen, and I laugh every time I read it. Uh, and it says, opinions are the authors, and not necessarily shared by the University of Maryland, but they should be. <laughs> so I, 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 it's, I still laugh. I've read it, I don't know how many times. Uh, he's also the author of Voodoo Science, The Road from Foolishness to Fraud. And he's special to us, uh, in addition to being local and being uh, a friend of us and speaking for us for many times. We honored his accomplishments uh, by awarding Dr. Park the Philip J. Class Award in, uh, in March of 2000. Eight. Eight. Eight, yes, for outstanding contributions and promoting critical thinking and scientific understanding. Uh, his talk for today is Superstition, Belief in the Age of Science. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Robert Park. Okay, uh, uh, Superstition, Belief in the Age of Science. Uh, it's an old saying that when a physicist writes a mystery story, He's going to start out with laws against violence and, uh, uh, and end up with discovering the body in the last chapter. Well, so I'm, I'm doing the kind of same thing. I'm going to talk about superstition by starting off with the definition. And superstition is a belief in supernatural forces. Uh, and that makes, by most polls, 90% of the world superstitious. Uh, and uh, because they believe in some sort of supernatural forces. Okay, um, now as we go through the talk, I want you to be aware of the millennium, which is, 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 uh, is we're now past, but I'm going to be uh, talking about events that occurred uh, at or around the millennium. All right, so there's Buckingham Palace uh, in the afternoon. This is the west face, and the sun is shining there on the west face. And uh, uh, this is in 2005. And up to the front gate pulls a, uh, uh, a limousine, the, the royal limousine, carrying a guest. And, uh, and everybody, all the servants in the, in the uh, palace stand out in front and greet the guest as he comes in. And, um, but as he got out of the limousine, the guest paused for a moment to look up at the wall. And, um, and that was the, the guest. It was Charles Towns, a physicist, a Nobel in physics in 1964. Uh, Twenty years later, he was, uh, got the National Medal of Science uh, uh, from President Reagan. And uh, in 2005, he got the Templeton Prize, and he was at Buckingham Palace to receive the prize from Prince Philip, who awards it personally. And um, now he paused to look up at that wall because he had been collecting butterflies since he was a boy in Greenville, South Carolina. And when you have collected butterflies for many years, your eye and brain become very sensitive to that fluttering motion. There's nothing else quite like it. And a butterfly collector spends the rest of his life responding to every little thing that flutters like a butterfly. And there was the butterfly that he saw. It was spring. It was in May. And um, the first butterfly out in the spring is usually this beautiful thing here, which in the UK, I think they call Camberwell's Beauty. Uh, in the United States, it's called the morning cloak because it looks like the cloak worn in mourning with a little row of blue buttons 
all the way around. It's a beautiful butterfly, and it's the first butterfly generally out in the spring. In fact, it overwinters. It, uh, it survives the cold uh, uh, and usually attaches itself to a tree where there has been a broken limb, a freshly broken limb, and, uh, and it spends the whole winter sipping the, uh, uh, the seepage out of that, staying in place, and then in the spring when it warms up, uh, it begins to, uh, to fly, and they have to spread their wings to collect energy. Uh, uh, they usually do not, unless it's very warm, they have difficulty flying. So they like to get on the west face of buildings in the afternoon and uh, spread their wings and, uh, uh, and collect energy. So there's a little naturalism, but not much to do with the talk, uh, except that uh, it, it's sort of characteristic of, uh, uh, of towns that he would, uh, he would still be interested in butterflies. Uh, Towns is now in his 90s and, uh, uh, and still goes in to the University of California every day. Um, and here he is. Uh, now, I got in a little trouble because I, uh, uh, I criticized him for accepting the Templeton Prize. And, um, now, so what is the Templeton Prize, and who is Templeton? And I should point out, this is not a small prize. This is the largest prize given for intellectual activity in the world. It is, in fact, larger than the Nobel Prize by design. When Templeton uh, put up the money for this, he decreed that it should always be bigger than the Nobel Prize, which of course also has an endowment and grows. And, uh, uh, but, but the Templeton Prize is always substantially larger. Um, well, who is this guy, Templeton? Uh, here's Sir John Templeton. Uh, uh, he died just a year ago, um, almost exactly a year ago. And, um, and as I say, it's, it says Sir John Templeton. So you might imagine that he was, this was a native of the UK. But as a matter of fact, he was born in Winchester, Kentucky, and uh, uh, in a small town, not unlike the Greenville, Mississippi, uh, uh, Greenville, North, South Carolina, that uh, uh, the towns had grown up in. Um, but his parents taught him two things that, uh, that, that sunk in. One was piety, and the other was frugality. He learned both lessons so well that he made a vast amount of money. Uh, you can see I've put the Templeton Growth Fund over here, and that's a, 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 a logarithmic plot. Uh, his, his value went up logarithmically for a lifetime, I, uh, a long lifetime, and uh, because of the uh, the part having to do with frugality, he left the United States to avoid the uh, uh, the income tax uh, and moved to Bermuda. So he is a uh, uh, was a British citizen uh, for those years. Um, uh, by all accounts, a uh, uh, a fine person. 